Okay, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Engaging Generation Z. I appreciate anyone who is here and watching and taking 30 minutes of your day to come and learn something from me. Uh, I just, this is one of my first webinars and I've, I've done them for other things and I just decided it's time to start sharing with the world some of the information I've acquired over the years. And I'm that nerd, I love to research, so why not share with all of these wonderful people that are keeping up with me on social media and, and I guess now YouTube. So thank you so much for watching this, I appreciate it. Um, this should be a quick 30 minutes and just kind of give you some ideas on how to engage your new generation in the classroom. So who am I? My name is Teresa Newley. I am now a career education consultant after spending many, many years in an educator's role, a director of education role, a campus director. Um, I was moving into a VP role and decided that I was ready to take a step back, actually work for myself and engage with more teachers like you all. So here I am. You can find me at Teresa Newley on just about every single social media platform. My website is www.teresamuley.com. I am hoping to do small monthly webinars like this uh, every single month, but I also travel around to schools and do full workshops. So I do four hour, eight hour, two day, whatever you might need, that's what I do. So today, it's not about me, it's about Generation Z. So what makes these guys tick? Why are they different than millennials? Why are they different than the other generations we've dealt with? I've been teaching for about 15 years and, and you know, I thought I was stoned for a loop with millennials because they were so different and they were so digitally connected. But Generation Z, while similar, has some attributes that makes them unique, makes them a little bit different. Okay, so some characteristics for Generation Z is first they were born between 1995 and 2015. This will vary according to what source you're looking. So I just kind of picked one, but you see the general kind of time timeline, time range of students coming into your classroom. So these guys right now are just now entering higher education. They're just now coming into career colleges. And so we've only had a couple years of graduates coming in so far and they're still new to us. And we cannot just group them with other generations. They're different, okay? These guys are very entrepreneurial. They wanna work for themselves. They wanna start a business. They don't understand this concept of working for somebody else for even a small amount of time. I don't know how many graduates I've seen from the programs I worked with that say, oh, I'm not going to go do this on my, I, I, for someone, I'm just going to go work for myself right away. And in my soul, I'm going, well, you need to understand a little bit about the business first, but that's just not how they think. They were born with technology in their hand. They are true digital natives. They have never had to know what life is like without a computer. Um, now, that being said, I will say they're not as attached to it as some of, as, as even millennials. My stepsister is a Generation Z and that kid is barely on social media. Her focus is on other things, but does she know how to work it? Absolutely, she does. They are very global thinking, which means it's not just about what's best for them. They're thinking about the world. They're thinking about their community. They are watching our earth kind of, I don't want to say fall apart, but they are watching all of this chaos. They are watching our actual planet kind of go into, I don't know, with, with climate change and all this stuff, right? It doesn't even matter what you think, but global thinking, these guys want to think about the big picture, not just about what's going on in their own lives. They are very budget conscious. They watched their parents go through the recession of 2008. I live in Southwest Florida and it was the housing bust capital. It is where everybody foreclosed. And so these guys watched that. They watched their parents struggle. They watched their families have to be rehomed. So they're very budget conscious and they really want to make sure that no matter what they do, they're getting a very solid return on investment. Generation Z values a career-driven education unlike what we've seen in a very long time. Um, these guys want to go to school, they want to get done, and they want to go to work. They are not interested in an eight-year degree. They are not interested in dragging this out. They just want to get to a place where they can get a little education in them and go to work. So thankfully, we are finally seeing trade school kind of becoming what it should be, in my opinion, um, is, is a go-to for a lot of students that maybe don't want to do this four-year thing. I, I believe in traditional education, but I also 
also think that we have a lot of purpose in the trades. And so this generation sees value where perhaps we haven't seen it before. Um, and finally, they would rather construct than be instructed. So what does that mean? That means they want to be a part of the learning process. They don't want to just show up and be delivered information. That is not how they work. They want to be able to partake in the development of their own education. They want to be active. They, they want to have choices. It's, it's just different. So they don't want you to show up and just say, here's what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. They want to be a part of the decision of how they're going to learn. So they would rather construct than be instructed. So what do they demand? They want information quickly. We are in a world where they can learn information off of YouTube very quickly. I know what you're thinking. Well, YouTube isn't school and YouTube isn't relevant and YouTube isn't always right. You are absolutely correct. Does it matter? No. It doesn't matter. They all are going to go to YouTube and if they can't get the information from us and they don't feel engaged with us, they are going to go learn it on YouTube. And if it's wrong, then so be it. They're going to have wrong information. So we've got to get the information to them quickly and in a way that is relevant to them. Also, everything we teach must have relevancy. So if it is not intentional, and you'll, you'll hear me mention intentional teaching a lot in this next 20, 30 minutes. If it is not intentional and it doesn't have a purpose for the lesson, then don't teach it. Make sure you're, you're staying on point and you're talking about what they're there for because the minute we digress into things that don't matter to them, we're gonna lose them. And then finally, they need to see a return on their investment. They have to see that their time and their energy and their money is worth it. And if it's not, then they're not going to stay through the program. They're either going to quit school, they're going to find another school, or they're going to find another pathway for themselves. So we have to make sure we make that return very evident to them. Okay, so how do we reach them? This is just a, cute, a few quick ideas, guys. You, There's so much you can do with this. There's so many different ideas out there. I had to find a few. I could probably do an eight-hour training on Generation Z and generational teaching because I love it so much. But it's really important that we just we, we do the research and we start looking. So here's just a few ideas to kind of get your brain going. Okay, so first is digital curation. So I've taught about digital curation in four or five different conferences now and I've gone and we've talked about it and so many of these things seem obvious but it's just finding the tools and so what digital curation is is the ability the ability to create content the opportunity to di digitally why I can't say that because I am not a generation Z um, connect to things what does that mean it means that this group of students wants to create content for social media and for the internet they want to create their own content while it's great to engage students through videos on YouTube that we've created or, you know, having them do different things, they want to create content themselves. So um, there's all different things that you can do with that. It could be creating that they create video videos and that they create webinars and they create wiki pages and things like that. But, you know, just to kind of get you started. Um, here's that I two that I like, and it's for digital collaboration. First is Mentimeter. So Mentimeter is cell phone driven word clouds. If you haven't seen a word cloud, it's a bunch of pretty words that people can that kind of summarize an idea. And the way Mentimeter works is you build the question. It's it is free. You will see that everything that I post up there has a free version of some sort. I don't believe we should have to pay for all these tools. And so you can pay for like advanced services. I don't think you need it though. Okay. So Mentimeter, what you do is you pose the question online and from their cell phones, they text in the words and then it creates this beautiful word cloud. What you can do from there is you can screenshot that and you can print it. So the students have created this brainstorming word cloud that just kind of inspires them to think about the big picture and inspires them to think about different perspectives, okay? Then you have MindMeister, which is an online mapping tool for questions, mind mapping, brainstorming, or project planning. So the way I tend to use MindMeister is almost as a parking lot. I've heard many educators out there mention the parking lot, which is kind of a safe place in the classroom where students can post questions about the lesson without actually raising their hand so they don't have to feel embarrassed if it's a stupid question or things like that. The problem with the parking lot is the student still actually has to walk to the area and post a question up there. So people still see who's posting what. Well, in MindMeister, you can create a MindMeister page for your class that day and at any time, 
students can anonymously actually post a post-it onto it with a question. And then periodically throughout your lesson, you can go in and you can actually start answering those questions and seeing who's posted what. You could also use it as brainstorming. So there's a lot of different things you can do with this stuff. Again, just trying to give you a couple tools today to, to kind of get the spark going and build some curiosity in you. The next idea is to create Instagrammable moments. Now, okay, I understand that the last thing you want to do is, while you're trying to build these lesson plans, also be thinking about what are some photo opportunities. I get that that seems counterproductive. However, it engages students and gets them to want to come to your class because they never know what's going to come next, right? So creating opportunities in your classroom and your lessons that inspire students to share their experiences. They're all about sharing what's going on in their life. They want to tell their story. So give them a chance. Give them something really cool to take photos of. Make a project that's so artistic that they can't wait to snap a photo and post it in, on Snapchat or Instagram or God, there's probably going to be a new thing. TikTok is a thing now, isn't it? I mean, so just think about different ways that you can engage that way. So here's some cool ones that I saw. Um, and this was me, guys. I just Googled Instagrammable moments in a classroom. Like, this is how I find my ideas is I'm attached to the internet. So I really loved the first one on the top right there that says, I am. And every single student kind of filled out what they were and created a wall in the classroom. What a cool way to bring social media into your classroom, to inspire students to share what's going on at the school, right? So it's super cool. The one to the left, I've done this one before. We filled an entire wall at Thanksgiving time with giving thanks and every day, every client, every prospective student, every faculty member, everybody in the building on a regular basis would write down on a post-it something they were thankful for. And we covered a wall between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was so cool. And it was so cool to go read, but it was also so cool because students were constantly snapping pictures and taking selfies in front of it, and it got the word out about what we were and who, who we were as a school. So very, very cool. Um, the one to the top left is, those are just photo booth props. So depending on what courses you're teaching and what the majors are that you're in, um, I just think it'd be cool to have some props so that students can take pictures while they're doing activities or whatever, just kind of tagging your class. I'm a big believer in class um, hashtags where your class starts so that they're constantly tagging the same class in it. So anyways, I thought that was a cool idea. And then to the bottom right, and now we know that talks about baby bubbles, but my thought there was, you know, a criminal justice degree, wouldn't it be cool to have like a mugshot type thing? And again, just giving them a chance to engage and post about their journey because they want to share with the world what they're doing. Give them the chance. Find a way to put that into your classroom. Okay, so the next idea is to allow students to customize their education. Students expect choices. Now, I expected pushback from this, because as teachers, we kind of have this mindset, well, I build my lesson and I build my structure and I build my assignments and that's what we do. But we got to get out of that. We, we have to start thinking of different ways to approach this. And surprisingly, every person that I've shared this idea with has been on board like that's amazing. Okay, so let me explain. Students nowadays are used to being able to customize everything. They can customize Netflix as to what kind of things they see on their feed. They can customize Snapchat. They can customize their Facebook. Do you remember when we had MySpace and it was so cool because we could customize the background and music playing? That felt good to us. So why are we not doing that in education? It also makes our jobs a little more fun because we're not reading the same papers over and over again. So the whole point with this is that when you you have an assignment and say your assignment is worth 20 points, give the students a choice as to how they present the material back to you. Why does it always have to be a paper? Why does it always have to be a video? Why can't they decide the method that works best for them? Now, I'm still saying you very much have structure and guidance and a rubric for grading so that there's no questions of what the expectations are, but sometimes Sometimes it is just as much work, if not more work, to build a video or a presentation as it is to write that paper. Okay, so some ideas for this is the paper, of course. Some students want to write. I'm a writer. Personally, I like to write. So I sometimes would rather do that than create a video any day because I, I like to write. So maybe it is paper. Maybe 
if I can get my little thing to work here. Um, maybe it is a video. Maybe students want to create a video presenting the topic for themselves. Cool. Give them an assignment. It has to be five to ten minutes. It has to be whatever you decide the parameters are, but make sure that you have expectations. It's not like a one minute video. Maybe it's a presentation. Don't we all say that the best way to learn something is to actually teach something? So maybe the students want to create their own PowerPoint and they want to present it in front of the class. Give them parameters, but what a great idea. Maybe they want to create a webinar. Some, um, some, most of our students are very savvy when it comes to technology. They would like to create a podcast or webinar all day, so give them the chance. Maybe that's the method they choose. Or maybe they're going to build an activity. I had a group of students, it was a very small class, and I was trying to come up with a review, and they said, can we make a game? And I said, sure. Those kids worked for hours making a board game with hundreds of review questions, and now that board game is used in other classes. Like, what a cool way for them to do their review, where, first of all, it didn't take any work on my part, but second, it forced them to review the entire chapter before the test, right? So get creative, let them decide how they're going to earn that 20 points or 50 points or whatever it might be. But why do we have to control everything? And I will tell you, grading becomes way more fun, my friends, when I don't have to read 20 papers. I can read three papers, watch four videos, see a few presentations, just plan it that way. Give them some choices. They will appreciate it, I promise. The next thing is just to remember to make it globally relevant. So what do I mean by that? It is not just about how does this apply in their life and in field. They wanna know that they can take the education and they can go elsewhere with it. Travel and, and taking care of themselves and free time is very important to this group of students. And it's, I think for a lot of us that work our butts off and we're, we're teaching and we're, we're managing and we're working, we don't understand this idea of you know, work-life balance, um, but this generation does. And so they wanna know that what they're learning can be applied throughout the world and what they're learning can help them in their goals to travel around the world. So you know, if you're teaching, I come from world of cosmetology, so if I'm teaching how to do hair and I'm doing a style, I might then do a project where I say, okay, now how will you take this technique? How will some wear this in Russia? How will somebody wear this in Asia? Like now adapt it for the culture that you're looking at. Give them opportunities to think about it globally. Also give them an opportunity to think about how they could give back to their community with this technique or with whatever information they're learning. Think outside of your classroom, please. They require it of us. Okay, the dreaded cell phone. Figure out a way to use it, my friends. You are not going to win the fight. It actually gives them anxiety when they don't have it near them. So when you say, put your phones away, you've lost their attention. They can no longer pay attention to you. So I know you think you're doing them a favor by saying, put your phone away. It's not because all their th they, they literally have an addiction to it, guys. And so if we don't just allow them to engage with it here and there, then we're not going to win. So instead, find a way to use it. So I'm going to give you a couple ideas here. And I know a lot of people are probably going, you are crazy. Um, I'm going to keep fighting the, the cell phone fight. Fine, fight it. I choose not to, and my classrooms are very productive because of it, because I can acknowledge the need to check your phone here and there. Now, you have a different problem when they're sitting and staring at it, but usually, guys, I'm going to say the big ugly, if they are sitting and staring at their phone, it's because they're not engaged with whatever you're doing in that classroom. Look at yourself before you start pointing fingers at them. They want to learn. That's why they're there. Everyone thinks I'm crazy, I'm sure. Okay. So a few ideas with cell phones, create videos. Seems obvious. I need to point out here that just because we may not be comfortable with video editing software and coming up with content, just because we might not know how, doesn't mean they don't know how, because they sure do, my friends. So um, let them create a video, give them a topic. Again, give them a rubric so it's not a free-for-all, but I have seen stellar videos come from student work. Um, and honestly, here's, here's the best part of it, guys, and we can share it on our social media, and it's a great marketing device for the school. And so a lot of us work at small schools, private schools that are just trying to get students in that door, creating videos. The students create these stellar videos. You can put them on your school's YouTube and your school's social media, and you can kind of show the world what it is that you do in that school. So, and the students love it, okay? 
um, using QR codes. So if you haven't, there's a lot of free websites out there that you can create your own QR codes. Um, what I've done with QR codes around my buildings is I've created basically scavenger hunts and they have to go find the QR codes are hanging all over the school. And when they scan it with their phone, a question pops up and then they have an answer sheet basically. And so they have to find all 25 QR codes around the building. And then they have to have the answers of the questions that I had asked in the QR code. And it's basically a game. So it could be a review game. I've done it in faculty trainings. Um, it's a lot of work to set up. I will tell you that. But once it is set up once, you can keep using it forever. Like you don't have to redo it. So just think about that. A lot of this stuff will take time at the beginning to get it set up and get it so that it's usable. But once it's done, you can keep using it. So anyways, QR codes, cool stuff, right? I mentioned this earlier, class hashtags. Um, everybody wants a way to kind of stand out from the crowd and so use a hashtag like we um in a school that i've been working at for a very long time now they do it i think every start where every class every cohort builds their own hashtag so every time they post something about school they include their hashtag some have even created shirts for themselves i mean it's just kind of a cool way to unify a class and you know when they feel unified and they feel like a family they're more likely to pull each other through a program and hopefully all graduate together which is the goal isn't it um, another idea with cell phones is silent discussions. So using some of the apps I mentioned earlier, like WordMeister and all that stuff, um, or MindMeister, sorry. There's others too out there. You can actually build a silent discussion where students are not actually allowed to speak in class, but they must post all of their comments through their phone. So you can also use Google Docs for this. There's so many things you can do that are free for this, guys, but it's kind of a unique way. Um, and I, again, you can do some of these anonymously so that students can really voice how they feel about something. You can do a debate on, you know, whether or not this new innovative thing is worth it or dangerous or whatever, and have them actually have that discussion silently through their phones where it just posts onto your screen. So cool idea. Another one is snap guides. This is something new. I haven't played around with it much. I mean, it's new to me. I don't know if it's new, new, but it's new to me. And what snap guides are, are tutorials. And so for so many of us in the career college sector, we are doing some type of hands-on practical work, right? So a snap guide is a free site kind of like Pinterest where people can create tutorials step by steps and then post them online. Well, great. If you do something that requires hands-on lab work, have them build a snap guide. How easy, right? And then Quizlet, quizzes, Kahoot, you know, all of those things that a lot of people have heard of by now, if you haven't, do some research. Quizlet and quizzes are cool. Um, Quizlet is an online flashcard app and you can build all of your own sets for your class if you want. You can have them build sets. And then if you're feeling lazy, a lot of the sets actually already exist. But what's cool about them is there's games that you can play. So it's more than just flashcards. You can play all these cool games with it to keep them engaged. It is literally how I got through my undergrad was Quizlet. Quizzes um, actually has like bejeweled blitz on it. And so you can have students competing for the high score. Lots of cool ways to have them review and, and it's all on their phone. It's all on their phone. So, you know, you want to use that phone and get them away from, uh, you know, from Facebook and give them a task on the phone because it's the only way you're going to win. So I think the moral of the story, guys, is there's a few things you have to remember. And like I said at the beginning of this, there are so many more ideas. I just wanted to kind of get your curiosity sparked, get you thinking about different ways to reach these guys. But remember, keep it relevant. If it is not relevant, they don't want to hear it from you. Keep it to the point. Do not digress in 15 other topics. Every time I read a student survey, they mention that, that the teacher can't stay on topic, okay? Connect it to real life. It doesn't matter how abstract it feels to you. You've got to find a way to connect it back to real life. And then finally, allow them to take part in the process. This generation does not want you just to come and act as the sage on the stage. They don't. They don't want to be lectured at. They want to be involved in the learning process. So find a way to keep them involved, okay? 
Okay, so if you're looking for more, um, I do all sorts of stuff out there, guys. I build personalized webinars like this for specific schools. So if you have a need at your school and you're like, oh, I don't want to pay for you to come out to my school. Cool. I can create a webinar for you. Um, and then you can keep it and you can play it and all sorts of great stuff, right? I do do on-campus trainings. Today I am driving over to Miami to do a training. It's my favorite way to engage with teachers because I get to just meet you guys and kind of see what's going on. And, and I get ideas from you all. I mean, I learn so much from the teachers that I work with. So it's amazing. Um, I also do school audits, so if you're trying to figure out what's going wrong in your school, um, I will fly to anywhere pretty much and sit and just watch and be that creep in the corner watching every single thing. Um, I have experience in everything from admissions to student services to being a campus director to being a VP. So um, I can really check almost every area of your school for compliance and all that jazz. I also do a lot of leadership training. I have built and grown lots of new leaders leaders um, in my career and it is something I love to do so if you've got some baby leaders that need a little guidance I'm happy to do that and then one of my favorite things ever is team building events I love to plan team building events I mean more than anything else probably so if you are looking for somebody to help you organize an event for your school to get your team unified just let me know and I'm happy to be a part of that okay so ways to reach me TM speaks at TeresaMuley.com is my email. Like I said, you can find me pretty much on every social media at Teresa Muley, and then my website is TeresaMuley.com. So thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate that you came back and you watched this, even if you didn't make it to my original actual session. I will be doing these every month, um, something little, just to kind of give you a taste of ideas. Um, please spread this, share this, show your faculty this, because I am literally here to make Make everyone's life easier and give you guys tools that I've taken on over the years. So thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful, wonderful day.